Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, the PSEG Foundation, and by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Finozzi. Hello, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Rhonda Schapler, in for Brianna Venozzi. It's back to the campaign trail for Governor Phil Murphy and Republican challenger Jack Cittarelli, the day after the two went head-to-head -head in a debate on NJPBS. The debate had its heated moments, with a few feisty exchanges on topics such as taxes and abortion, the raucous crowd added to the drama with both candidates trying to avoid being drowned out by cheering or jeering. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan analyzes if either candidate made headway with voters on the fence with election day less than three weeks away. The candidates dueled for an hour as a rowdy crowd jeered and cheered the campaign's final debate between incumbent Democrat Phil Murphy and Republican challenger Jack Cittarelli at Rowan University. Viewers witnessed verbal jousting on the pandemic, the economy, and more, but neither candidate scored a knockout. No harm, no fouls, no home runs. There you go. If doing what they had to do was getting through the night, making their points, appealing to their bases, they both did that. That's where the tie goes to the person who's ahead. That'd be Murphy, up by between 9 and 13 points, according to the latest polls, and leading in public opinion on how he's handled the pandemic. Surveys show that's voters' biggest concern. Chitterelli continued his opposition to controversial mask and vaccination mandates. But I think the best way to get as much cooperation as we possibly can is to find policy that works for a majority of people as opposed to a very heavy-handed or one-size-fits-all approach. Cittarelli criticized Murphy for speaking without a mask at a recent indoor fundraiser, but the governor noted both of them were appearing maskless to speak on the debate stage. Murphy, however, shed little light on inquiries into the more than 8,500 COVID deaths at long-term care facilities. The tragedy within the tragedy is in long-term care, and there will be a full accounting without question, independent of my office of this. With Democrats holding a 1 million plus majority amongst registered New Jersey voters, Cittarelli continued reaching out to the moderates. Analysts say he needs to win. Asked twice if he'd campaign with the former president. Is that a no? A no to him campaigning with me? Yes. Uh, David, I go out there and campaign on my own. I'll win my own election. Okay. He showed that, you know, he's not just kind of falling in line with the, you know, the, the elements of the Texas Republican Party, for example, I think showing that his stripes that he's more of a more of a New Jersey Republican, where you, know, you can still be conservative on the issue, but maybe not as far to the right as others. Saying he doubts the U.S. Supreme Court will overturn Roe v. Wade, Cittarelli promised to codify abortion rights in New Jersey law within limits, but only if the landmark decision is overturned. If that's what we need to do here in New Jersey to protect the woman's right to choose, we will do that. I will be very happy if you're right about Roe v. Wade, but I'm not expecting that, sadly, with this Trump-packed Supreme Court. Um, so re reproductive, <clears throat> reproductive Freedom Act is essential. On the budget, Murphy argued, state spendings ballooned by billions because of long overdue payments into pension systems and education aid. Cittarelli, while critical, wouldn't list what programs he'd cut. Perhaps the night's best exchange came after Murphy blamed New Jersey Transit's continued lack of dedicated funding on prior administrations. If you talk about the mess that we inherited, the mess within the mess was NJ Transit. Uh, nobody, no, no engineers, political cronies, underfunding, uh, uh, unsafe, a disaster. We are fixing NJ Transit. You asked for the job. You knew what you were getting yourself into, and yet, you know what we hear repeatedly from you? It's always the previous administration's fault or Donald Trump's fault. Okay. So, that's because it's the truth. The crowd sometimes got so raucous, despite repeated shushing from panelists and moderator Brianna Venosi, it cut into time available for rebuttals and questions. I was disappointed there was no real discussion about urban voters, 
Black and Latino voters, the specifics about how we're going to address them. Did the debate help connect candidates to voters? This is literally about going forward or going backward. And I want to say, Brianna, I think you did a heck of a job considering uh, the, uh, the, the, the environment. I do feel as though I got my point across. I answered the questions, uh, but uh, the process felt a little bumpy. We have a referendum. That is the message uh, from Cedarelli versus a choice. That's the message from the Murphy campaign. We'll see who connected better on November 2nd. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. For more debate analysis and what's next for both of the campaigns, I spoke with senior political correspondent David Cruz and chief political correspondent Michael Aaron. Michael, let me start with you as a seasoned observer of many political campaigns and debates. What did you make of last night's get together? That was about as good a debate as I've ever seen. Uh, I thought both men were at the top of their game. Uh, one of David Cruz's guests in the after program said that uh, Cherelli was polished. I think he was polished and uh, Murphy was passionate uh, and vice versa. There, there's some polish about Mur Murphy too and there's some passion about Cittarelli as well. So I thought it was a high level debate. The panel did well. The candidates were really very strong. I, uh, they didn't skip a beat. They, they were pretty amazing. David, let me turn to you then. I guess the question is, did the performance of either candidate potentially sway voters? We were talking about that yesterday, uh, whether or not there's even a real uh, quantifiable pool of voters that are undecided. And we decided that they probably are. Um, but as far as last night's debate, moving the needle either way, I think at times it got so boisterous and the audience became so much a part of uh, the debate that some people who may not have been partisans going into the debate probably left saying, let me see who else is on this ballot. So I don't know that it moved the needle a lot. I don't know that debates generally move the needle much unless someone really messes up pretty badly. And I don't think anybody messed up that badly yesterday. Michael, back over to you. What do both candidates have to do now in the few short weeks remaining before Election Day? <clears throat> Pound their messages in through advertising. Uh, and Philip Murphy has a big advantage in that department because he has about $7 million of public matching funds left to spend compared to Jack Cedarelli's $1.5 million. I think Murphy's been saving his money for a final blitz. Uh, their ads on both sides are pretty good. I think we're just going to see many more for Murphy. David, pick up on this money point that Michael raised, if you will. I mean, can Jack Cittarelli get free advertising that's going to help him? And can he come back from the difference that we're seeing currently in the polls? I, I mean... I guess it's possible. Uh, I don't think that he has the, uh, the money to compete one for one with, uh, with the governor as far as television advertising goes. We talked about that last night as well. And there was a sense that um, if there is an enthusiasm gap on the Democratic side and momentum on the Republican side, as the Republicans seem to suggest, then it's going to come down to who has an operation that can go out into the field and get out the vote. Conventional wisdom says that the Democrats are much better at that than the Republicans. The Democrats tend to represent dense urban areas. Republicans are spread out in rural areas. Uh, there may be an enthusiasm problem on the, Repub on the Democratic side, but uh, it's believed that they're just inherently better at getting people to the polls on election day. Yep. Michael, David, thanks for your observations and comments. Good to chat with you guys. Good Thank to see you. you. Not being able to afford to buy food or to pay the rent is sadly all too common for lower income households. And COVID-19 has only made those financial challenges worse, especially for people of color. Raven Santana reports on a new study that puts some numbers around the hardships. 
Despite billions of dollars being appropriated by federal and state governments during the pandemic to protect vulnerable Americans, a new poll highlights the pandemic's racial health disparities. This recent survey was conducted in, in, in August, more than a year and a half into the, into the pandemic. And what we found is that, you know, in, in spite of the historic federal assistance that has come to people across the country, uh, there are still a lot of households that are, that are hurting. Uh, lower income households in particular, and disproportionately households of color, Black, Latino, Native American homes. According to the new data from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and NPR, the majority of families most impacted by COVID-19 earned less than $50,000 a year, and of those families, 30 percent lost all their savings. The poll also found that 14 percent reported serious problems paying their mortgage or rent, 14 percent of households reported serious problems affording food, and 11 percent reported serious problems making car payments, while 18 percent reported facing other serious financial problems. Problems. Dr. Rich Besser is the president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is an underwriter of NJ Spotlight News. Dr. Besser, who is also the former acting director of the CDC, says the health of Americans should be just as much a priority for the health care organizations that care for them. You know, if 12 states decide not to give people food or water, uh, the federal government would step in and act. But here you have 12 states that have decided not to give people access to, to health care. The federal government needs to step in and take care of this problem. Taking baths at the local McDonald's, the local Burger Kings, you go in there, you wash up or whatnot, you take your child in there. Luis Rivera knows he struggles firsthand. The Trenton resident, who has struggled financially as a single dad to support his own family during COVID, also works with the nonprofit Arm in Arm. The organization assists low-income families with common challenges during the pandemic, like food and housing. I know a family right now, it's, it's, it's the husband, he's a roofer. And they have, they're living at her, their van. They try the best that they can to find a place to stay or whatnot. And, only, and, and this is a United States citizen that who's struggling, who got caught up in the pandemic, who ended up listening to these landlords and, and he didn't know that they, 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 they could not get evicted. The basic underlying theme in the poll and what we've seen throughout the pandemic is that housing is health and health is housing. They're really inseparable. Stacy Berger is the president and CEO of the Housing and Community Development Network of New Jersey. Berger says the poll highlights disturbing trends, like having to put off receiving medication simply because they can't afford it. Some of the data we saw before the pandemic showed though that lower income tenants in particular are giving up their medical needs, they're foregoing taking medication, they're foregoing going to the doctor, taking care of their families, even some routine medical um, interventions that many folks just take for granted, like a flu shot, are things that people who are living paycheck to paycheck simply cannot afford to do because the house uh, the housing costs are just so out of control. Dr. Besser, Berger, and Rivera are now calling on local lawmakers to raise awareness about the disproportionate amount of black and brown households that are still in crisis more than a year and a half after the start of the pandemic. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. An FDA advisory panel meets tomorrow and Friday to discuss whether to back booster doses for both the Johnson & Johnson and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. But new research by the National Institutes of Health finds those who receive the J&J &J shot may be better off getting a booster through Pfizer or Moderna. And new briefing documents from the FDA in advance of Thursday's meeting questioned the strength of evidence in the clinical data submitted by New Jersey-based J&J, &J, which the company said supported the need for a booster at six months or later. The FDA analysis found that J&J &J used a test in its research that may not have been sensitive enough. Healthcare workers on the front lines of the COVID-19 fight are battling fatigue and other stresses. So Rutgers has now launched a new mental health helpline for thousands of nurses in our state. The confidential peer support service connects them with retired or former nurses trained in mental health who are able to lend an ear and provide help. The helpline is called Nurse to Nurse. I talked with Barbara Brilliantine, a nurse and helpline counselor. Thank you so much for being with me to talk about this very important topic about giving support to those frontline workers who supported all of us through the worst of the pandemic. 
What was behind starting a hotline where nurses can get help from people who know what they have experienced? Uh, well, this uh, peer support line um, is piggybacked off of uh, the cop to cop line, which has supports for cops and cops. Um, this, the nurses, nurse to nurse, this was actually um, uh, already being, this was conceived before the pandemic and this was being worked on. So uh, luckily we we're able to get it out um, at, at such an important time, but um, uh, that's where it comes from. What are some of the counselors hearing from the nurses who are reaching out? Yes, that's a great question, Rhonda. Um, right now, probably some of the biggest issues that nurses are facing are uh, feelings of um, overwhelmed as well as exhaustion. And uh, I'm also hearing a lot of um, morale uh, issues, which uh, for nurses, mm, usually our morale is pretty high. Um, we, we're very passionate on what we do, um, no matter um, which arena we're working in. Um, so everyone's feeling a little beat up uh, in every which way right now. Certainly not surprising, uh, right. given the work that we've seen over the last couple of months. What advice are they receiving? How are they supposed to get through this period? What do the counselors say to them? Each call is completely individual. Uh, what one nurse um, might be um, feeling overwhelmed with is, and their experience might be different than another one. So it is case by case basis. But the important thing here is that they are speaking to a peer. Uh, a fellow nurse. We've all walked in the same shoes and had very similar experiences in one way or another. So you're speaking to someone who has walked in your shoes and has had um, the uh, training um, to help guide you through this and make a wonderful connection with you, to be quite honest. It, it's been really rewarding. Yeah, as I was going to ask you about, you know, some of the retired nurses and others who are on the other end of that phone call, that very crucial phone call, mm -hmm. how are they responding to this role they're playing? With pride, uh, as well as uh, something I hear over and over again, which I'm not surprised because we are nurses, um, is, uh, it is, this is my way of giving back at this time. It really is um, a wonderful initiative that is underway, and we certainly hope that this work will help a lot of nurses who definitely need it now. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Rhonda. Appreciate it so much. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. In 2017, New Jersey enacted criminal justice reforms in an effort to stop defendants from being detained for weeks or even months because they could not afford to post cash bail. Now, four years into the reforms, what does the data show about how it's working? Leah Mishkin reports on the successes and the changes that advocates still want to be made. It used to be that you were charged with a crime. A judge set a bail amount, and if you couldn't afford it, you'd stay in jail until your trial. That changed nearly five years ago when New Jersey enacted criminal justice reform. Now that it's got an outstanding system that determines whether or not someone's going to be held over in jail based upon risk factors, whether they're going to return, whether they're a dangerous society, rather than if they have the monetary amount of money to get out. And, and that makes a heck of a lot more sense. Data from a new report by New Jersey courts confirms the change in the system has resulted in more serious offenders and fewer low-risk defendants awaiting pretrial in jail. In 2012, 12% of inmates were waiting in jail because they couldn't afford a bail of $2,500 or less. That number has dropped to 0.2% or 14 inmates in 2020. And bail, the court spokesperson says, is only used as a last resort, usually when someone continuously fails to appear in court. 
which isn't happening often. The report finds the people arrested in 2019 showed up for about 90.9% of court appearances. The legislation that we passed uh, several years ago is working. Another way to measure the success of bail reform is to look at how many people waiting for their trial on the outside end up being charged for new crimes. This report finds for three consecutive years, the rate has remained low, around 13.7%, from 2017 to 2019. The other intended effect, which is we're saving lots of money on uh, on taxpayers' backs. Because the jail population has been cut by roughly 40 percent since 2012, some counties have decided to share services to reduce costs. There's about six or seven counties that, um, you know, are in those types of agreements. So I would say by the end of 2021, say we'll have 14 county jails. It's a significant amount of salaries and wages and health benefit expenses that the counties that are uh, closing their jails are, uh, are, are saving. The racial disparities still remain. Black defendants make up nearly 60% of all the people incarcerated in New Jersey on a one-day snapshot in 2020. And 68 percent, New Jersey courts say, were charged with serious offenses. As Chief Justice Stuart Rabner writes, black defendants are more likely than white defendants to be arrested and more likely to receive a complaint warrant, which requires a trip to jail, as opposed to a summons, which allows for immediate release. Adding, New Jersey's justice system is fairer and more equitable today under CJR. But we must continue to work together with stakeholders across the criminal justice system to confront inequities wherever we find them. Any system that, that uses prior convictions as a basis to determine whether someone is likely to to commit a crime in the future is likely to replicate the racial disparities that we hope to leave behind. An ACLU senior supervising attorney, Alexander Shalom, says that's still part of the formula in New Jersey. I think the courts have been very responsive to concerns about disparities. They've done an admirable job of tracking it. The next step is to start making fixes to it. Shalom says he also hopes the right to a speedy trial is also addressed since people are sitting in jail for too long, he says because of a backlog created by COVID since trials weren't happening. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Leia Mishkin. In our Spotlight on Business tonight, you may have noticed you're paying more for a whole lot of things. Inflation surged again in September, pushing consumer prices up 5.4% for the year. That annual increase is a 13-year high. Costs are rising for some key essentials like housing, food, and gasoline. Economists blame some of the increases on those supply chain bottlenecks we've been reporting on. Prices did fall for a few things like used cars and airline fares in September, but with overall prices for so many goods rising sharply, many people are feeling squeezed. And that's because average hourly wages are no longer keeping pace with inflation based on the latest data. If you are a commuter bound for New York on an NJ Transit train, you have probably been on your way in only to hear this announcement. We're delayed because the portal bridge is stuck. Well, after years of delays, that more than century old span is getting replaced. The NJ Transit Board approved a $1.6 billion contract for a new bridge. It will stand 50 feet above the Hackensack River, 25 feet higher than the current bridge, which would allow more ships to pass under the bridge without disrupting train traffic. Construction could begin in just a few months, and the first track is scheduled to open a little more than four years from now. The Portal Bridge replacement is part of the Gateway Project, which also involves replacing the Hudson River train tunnels. Now let's take a look at the closing numbers on Wall Street. Support for the Business Report provided by New Jersey Monthly Magazine, covering all of New Jersey, what to do, where to go, and so much more on local newsstands and online at njmonthly.com.
that does it for us this evening, but be sure to tune in to Chatbox with David Cruz tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. David will talk with former Governor Christine Todd Whitman about the state of the Republican Party in New Jersey and around the country and what she says the GOP needs to do to save the party. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Have a great night. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie. How are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever. In uncertain times, you need someone who has your back. That's why at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, we make sure our health plans have all the benefits you need. More ways to get care virtually. More support for your mental health, too. More tools on your phone. All in a range of health plans so you and your family can find just what you need. And we can help. Because everyone should feel like someone has their back. Not just in uncertain times. All the time.